Hi class, welcome. It's Dr. Lindner. What are we going to be talking about in this uh, next series is muscle, um, muscle contraction, different types of contraction, uh, and then we'll move on to some muscle physiology, how muscles contract. So before we get into all of that, it's important to, to understand what some of the main functions of muscle tissue are. Now, if we think back to tissues, we said that there were four types of tissues. We said that there was epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nerve tissue. In relationship to muscle tissue, we said there were three types. We said that there was skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. What we're going to be focusing on now is going to be skeletal muscle. So when muscles contract, those skeletal muscles, when muscles contract, they transmit their contractile tension or their contractile force to tendons which attach to bones. So if this is a bone and this is a bone, let's say this is the elbow joint, we're going to have a muscle, we'll say this being the biceps, let's say this is the humerus, and let's say this is the radial bone. So the biceps attaches from the humerus to the radius, and when it contracts, it makes the elbow bend. This is the belly of the muscle, and muscles attach to bone by way of tendons. So there's typically a proximal tendon and a distal tendon. The proximal tendons are what we call the origin, O for origin, and the distal tendon is typically what we call the insertion. So we have origins and insertions of muscles. The origin is typically the more proximal tendinous attachment, and the insertion is the more distal tendinous attachment. Muscles attached to bones by way of tendons. Okay, when muscles contract, Sometimes they don't produce movement. Sometimes they just stabilize the body. They help to hold it in its position. So we have lots of postural muscles. We have core muscles that when they contract, they help to maintain our posture. Muscles have the ability of storing and mobilizing substances within the body. Well, one of the things that muscles need uh, to function is energy, and energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate. But in order to make adenosine triphosphate, we need glucose. We need glucose and we need oxygen. And glucose looks like this. Glucose is this six carbon sugar, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, six carbons. It's a six carbon sugar. And glucose is necessary in order for us to create ATP. But we need oxygen as well. Now, Glucose in high concentrations is toxic. So the body can store glucose and the storage form is called glycogen. Anything that ends in ogen means it's in the storage form or it's inactive. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose because glucose in high concentrations, high blood sugar is toxic. 
it's toxic to your blood vessels, it's toxic to your neural system, it's toxic to your eyes, to your kidneys. So the body doesn't want to keep all the glucose around. We'll put some in storage and it's going to store it in muscle. And it can store it in the liver as well, in the muscle in the liver primarily. Now, glucose can be broken down. And when it's broken down, this bond here and this bond here are broken down. And then you get something that looks like this. Right, if we remove that and we break that bond, right, then all you're left with are these two three carbon sugars, right? We split this. We split the glucose. And when you split it, that process is called glycolysis. Here's the word lysis. Lysis means to split. So glycolysis is nothing more than taking glucose, the six carbon sugar, splitting it down the middle so that what you get are these two six, uh, three carbon sugars. And then that's called pyruvate. Or some call it pyruvic acid. Okay. Now, this pyruvic acid can enter the mitochondria of the muscle cell in the presence of oxygen, and energy can be produced. Okay? Okay. So, <clears throat> muscles can store sugar in the form of glycogen, and it can mobilize substances as well. And when muscles contract, they can generate heat. Think of what happens when you exercise. When you exercise and your muscles are contracting, your body gets hot and you perspire to try and cool off your body. Think of what happens if someone has a fever. Maybe they have 104 fever and all of a sudden they feel cold and their muscles start to shiver. So the muscles, like the jaw, can shiver quickly, your traps, your biceps, all your large muscle group muscles can contract so that when muscles contract, they can raise your body temperature to help fight off any bacteria or viruses. Okay, so that's some of the, the main functions and some of the properties of muscle is that muscles are electrically excitable. If you've ever been to a doctor of chiropractic, if you've been to a uh, physical therapist, sometimes they'll put a TENS unit or electric stim, and they'll put those pads on your muscle, turn it on, and all of a sudden, your muscles are contracting without any conscious or voluntary thought. So muscles are electrically excitable. They have the ability to contract. Contraction means that there's tension that's being generated on the muscle. And you can have tension on a muscle as a muscle is shortening. You can have tension on a muscle as it's lengthening. And you can have tension on a muscle if it's not shortening or lengthening, but just remaining the same length. Muscles have the ability of extension, and they have a degree of elasticity. Now, when we look at different contractions, you heard me say before that contraction means there's tension, and tension can happen when a muscle is shortening, if it's lengthening, or if it stays the same length. Let me show you what that looks like. In picture A, where it says concentric contraction, this person is starting here at position one. They're ending up here in position two. We have gravity working downwards, right? 
we have gravity working down. Here, you've got your biceps muscle in the front, which is generating tension. It's pulling from its origin and its insertion, and it's going to move from position one to position two. It's going to move the weight of the book. This is the load or the resistance or the weight. This could be a book. This could be a dumbbell, right? This could be a person doing a curl with a dumbbell or a barbell. So when the tension is strong enough to overcome gravity plus the resistance or the load, then you can move in this direction. This muscle here, the origin of the muscle and the insertion of the muscle, they move closer together. That's called a concentric contraction. Where in number two, where it's eccentric contraction, the starting point was up here, the ending point was down here. And here they slowly lowered the book, right? They were in control of the movement, but they were slowly lowering it against the force of gravity. Now, it's not too heavy where it just collapses. It's a nice, slow, controlled movement. So here was the origin of the muscle. Down here is the insertion. And that's the biceps brachii. If we compare the length of the muscle in B compared to the length of the muscle in A, it looks like in B, the biceps are elongating whereas in A, the biceps are shortening. So when the origin and insertion approximate, move closer together in that shortening phase, that's concentric contraction. When the origin and insertion move further away, where the muscle is elongating, that's an eccentric contraction. And in the word eccentric is E for elongate. Right? The muscle is elongated. Now in C, we have isometric, which means same length. Isometric, same meter, same length. That means the muscles in the front and the muscles in the back are contracting at the same time. And there's no joint movement because you have these muscles contracting and these muscles contracting to stabilize the book right here in the middle, that's isometric. So during contraction, you can have a shortening, you can have a lengthening, or muscles remaining the same length, but there's still tension. So concentric is when muscle tension exceeds the resistance, right? That's the book. When it can exceed the resistance, and the muscle shortens. That's where the origin and insertion move closer together. We call that the positive contraction or the acceleration phase. Eccentric is that the peak tension is less than the load and the muscle elongates. Eccentric elongates. The origin and the insertion move further apart from one another that's the negative contraction, also known as the deceleration phase. So there are some people, when they exercise, they can go to the gym and they'll say, hey, I'm doing negatives. I'm doing negative contractions or I'm doing positive contractions. And one of the, the best ways to exercise are very fast, rapid accelerations and very slow decelerations. So you're maximizing the concentric contraction and you're maximizing the eccentric contractions. Isometric is when there's tension, but it never exceeds the resistance. So you get no change in the joint angle. There's tension, but no change. That's isometric. Okay, you heard me use the words origin and insertion. Origin is usually the more proximal part. And it's usually the part that's staying still 
whereas the insertion is the more distal part, and it's usually the part that moves. So if we go back, the origin is up here, this is staying still, and it's the radius down here that's moving, whether it be in eccentric or even concentric. The origin is staying still, and it's the insertion that's actually moving. What do we mean by agonist and antagonist? So agonist is the main muscle that provides the movement. And an antagonist is one that's going to oppose it. So agonist and antagonist are opposite. So if we went back to this picture and I said, okay, the biceps is the agonist for elbow flexion, what would be the antagonist? Well, agonist and antagonist are doing opposite things, they must be on opposite sides of the part of the body. So if this muscle is in the front and it flexes the elbow, there has to be a muscle in the back that extends it. So you have the biceps in the front and you would have the triceps in the back. Agonists, antagonists. A synergist is a muscle that helps the agonist. So a synergist in, let's say this case, if I said the biceps is flexing the elbow, can you name a synergist to it? You could sit, list any other elbow flexor, like the brachioradialis or the brachialis. If I said the triceps is the main elbow extensor, can you name a synergist then you would say the anconius. Innervation. What do we mean by innervation? If you look at the word innervation, we see the word nerve. So in order for muscles to contract, they have to have a nerve supply. The muscles of the upper extremity, meaning every muscle of the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, the fingers, they all come from nerves that originate in the neck, and that group of nerves are called the brachial plexus. And that stems from C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1 nerve roots. All the muscles of the lower extremity, your hip, your thigh, your knee, your ankle, your toes, they're going to come from a group of nerves from the lower back, primarily the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. And again, they originate from different levels of the lower spine. In order for muscles to contract, they need nerve supply. If the nerves are damaged, then muscles atrophy, meaning they waste away and deteriorate. The opposite of atrophy is called hypertrophy. So if you exercise muscles, they can increase in size, they thicken, that's hypertrophy. If you break a limb or you're bedridden and the muscles aren't being used, they atrophy. Good place to take our first break. When we come back, we'll get into the histology of skeletal muscle. 